Hello and welcome to another episode of Fintech Focus TV with me, Toby Babb. Today, I am utterly delighted to be joined by two of my Fintech favourites. It's Brendan Bradley and Suzanne Chisty. How are you both? Very well, thanks, thanks Toby. Toby. Listen, lovely to have you both on the show uh, and a really exciting time, really exciting stuff to be talking about with uh, the launch of another new book for you, Suzanne, and, and co-authored by Brendan as well, Fintech for Dummies. Guys, tell us a little bit about, actually, before we go into that, Tell us a little bit about your background. Suzanne, I'll, I'll start with you, if I may. Of course. Uh, yes, I, I'm Suzanne Chisti. I'm the CEO of Fintech Circle. And Fintech Circle, we do three things. On one, on one side, we invest in fintech startups. So we are a group of about 70 investors. And our goal is to find the best fintech entrepreneurs, the best startups, which look for seed capital. So early stage seed capital. And we invest you know, pre-series A in those fintech companies in the UK mainly. And uh, the second thing of what we do is education. Uh, that's where we published already six books as part of our fintech book series. And now our seventh book is a fintech for dummies book, which we're very excited about, which we'll talk more about today. And the third area of what we do is events, you know, webinars, online, online virtual conferences now. So it's all about basically getting our community together. And Fintech Circle, we are now almost 200,000 people, you know, globally across all of our social media channels and our book communities and also our investor, you know, our communities globally. So our goal is to really bring, you know, people together who can benefit from working together and also raise, you know, awareness for issues such as diversity or financial inclusion, uh, things which are important to us. You know, that's also what we want to focus on and move the agenda forward. I think you guys have been doing a fantastic, fantastic job on that. And we'll come on to that a little bit more in, in, in a moment as well. Brendan, give us your background as well. Uh, I've been mainly capital markets uh, for over 30 years and um, uh, mainly exchanges. Uh, so doing lots of product development, business development in the early years, which led me through to be on the Eurex board and the chief innovation officer uh, before I left. Um, and then part of that really was on the innovation side, uh, was actually investing in some early stage fintech firms directly ourselves. Uh, so we did four different deals um, while I was there on that. Then we um, seeded Illuminate Financial um, as Deutsche Börse with, jointly with Market. Um, and they've obviously been very successful uh, since then. Seen, you, seen Mark on here sort of in the past, of course. He has, yeah. Um, and um, then we, I helped set up the corporate venture fund uh, that Deutsche Börse had as well. Uh, and uh, it came to a point where I decided to go out and start doing this directly myself a bit more. Um, so effectively, um, the, the difficulty that we found at the time, which would be four years ago now, was finding enough capital markets, B2B fintech firms mm. um, that could be invested in. Um, and particularly looking at it at a seed level. Uh, so getting the guys early who'd maybe been bootstrapping it for a year or so themselves and looking to use the SEIS, EIS benefits in the UK, uh, because obviously that mitigates a lot of the risk with, uh, associated with that. So um, we set up Seismic Foundry uh, to effectively uh, run that uh, with respect to investing in sort of firms at that level. And outside of that, I've done a lot more myself in terms of investing and also then uh, acting as non-exec on quite a number of different boards for fintech firms. Uh, and you've had a few of those on as well. Um, I've seen. <laughs> but it's like push-pull um, and uh, some of the guys that are more associated with the investment association uh, would be Kite Edge, um, uh, Fregnan uh, and Waymark would be sort of three, sort of some of the other ones that have been on as well. So, but, uh, so yeah, for me, it was really then as part of that process, uh, Suzanne and I got in, involved four years back actually uh, because that was the first SEIS uh, FinTech Circle Fund. Um, and uh, I invested in that. Uh, and so, of course, we got to know each other through that. And so we've actually been advising the firms in that particular portfolio over the last four years. Um, and then it was a case of, um, with the book, you know, trying to get together and actually doing sort of something directly together. And this is where it came up. So tell us a little bit about the book. I mean, it's uh, um, 
you know, it, it, you, we're talking about two people here with incredible networks, incredible experience. You're seeing all sorts of different things from so many different spectrums, and and an area that I absolutely love these fast growth um, stories of, of of you know businesses in the fintech space that are allowing themselves to grow. But it remains a mystery, you know, is about exactly what fintech is to you know to many many people. Fintech has got so many different um, backgrounds from capital markets through to payments through to all different sorts of areas. And you guys have managed to demystify this with, with uh, Fintech for Dummies. Suzanne, tell us a little bit about the background behind it, behind the book, why it sort of uh, uh, has been published and, and why you guys have got in, involved with that. Sure. I mean, the, the, the background is the Fintech book series. Initially, you know, here our goal was to demystify, as you said, uh, Toby, the topic, you know, to people who either are not technologists, you know, people who are bankers and want to understand Fintech, or people who are coming also from outside sectors, so for example, the telecom sector or students, or just very senior management, you want to understand the future, you know, of our mm. industry. And the Fintech for Dummies book, of course, is from the famous dummy series from Wiley, the US publisher. There are often very complicated topics are taken and, and explained more easily. This was the goal for our book as well as our goal really was to, number one, explain what the Fintech sector is all about. And we visually explained that with the so-called Fintech cube. You know, and the Fintech cube is a three dimensional cube where you can imagine each side of the cube has got a different uh, purpose. You know, the first side uh, talks about the various areas in banking, you know, from asset management to insurance to trading to cash management, you know, so all areas of banking is one axis, you can imagine. And the second axis of this matrix is about which business model the fintech company applies. So it could be a B2C business model, business to consumer, it could be B2B business to business, could be B2G business to government, or a platform based business model, or it could be a peer to peer lending, you know, so we've got already two axes now in this cube. And the third axis to explain in the fintech sector holistically and or top down is which type of technology do you use you know do you use cloud computing do you use ai do you use blockchain technologies do you use the internet of things and what we did in this book is to start you know almost from top down approach to explain the principles first and then drill into the details to explain what the business models mean how they look like what the technologies mean and how they can be put to in practice, you know, nowadays, how can, how can it be implemented? And also about the key ecosystem, you know, explaining the stakeholders, who are those investors who invest in fintech companies, who are the entrepreneurs, what is a unicorn, you know, and really explaining all the elements one needs to understand to get a good grasp of the fintech sector and to participate in it as well. You know, our goal is that all the people who read it get excited about fintech and actually want to be part of it you know mm. at one one role or the other so that's that's our goal that's a big overview you know of the fintech sector and and, and um i would say you know brendan uh was brilliant because brendan as, as brendan explained you know you brought so much depth into the whole capital market space into the investing space you know how does investment universe work how does capital markets work because often those areas we have not seen as much innovation as in the retail banking side, you know. So maybe Brendan, if do you want to highlight some of the areas and the topics you which were most keen to your heart as well? So, yeah, I think the thing we should mention at this point as well is that um, our co-authors from New York uh, were from uh, the fintech firm Numerix. So Numerix, uh, no longer a startup, has probably been out there for what, 20 plus years. Uh, so it's a very successful company in itself and um, the beneficial thing with having them involved is they have obviously a big group of technologists so when it came to getting down into the weeds with respect to open source technologies cloud uh, artificial intelligence uh, we could actually utilize their expertise with respect to getting more deep into those areas and i think that was the key thing really for us was that um you mentioned it, Toby, the, the kind of fintech space is quite a broad church. Mm. So it was really trying to make sure that you kind of got a, a feeling for um, the breadth that was there. 
But then what I think we found was is that a lot of the, uh, the books tend to really focus much more towards B2C, uh, a retail focus. Whereas yeah. we really wanted to focus here a lot more on a B2B side, uh, yeah, with some of that being the capital markets. Um, but you know, a lot of people would kind of say, well, a dummies book is kind of for, for idiots. But actually, that's not the case at all from our perspective. At least that's not the way the book's written, for sure. Um, the view <laughs> is in for that a actually, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> the, the view is it's it's for people that actually are in the markets that understand a lot of what's going on around them. But um, as uh, I think Suzanne's put it in something else that she has, um, is they're bluffing it. So yeah. they're all using lots of buzzwords uh, and you know, kind of talking around topics, but don't really delve into the depth of it. Uh, and so therefore, you know, the, the idea here is, is really to allow people to get one, a broad sort of spectrum of where the fintech market is, go into areas like the investment and you know, how it is that firms um, are generated, you know, actually brought together and actually create a fintech firm. Uh, but then on top of that, actually saying, here's some of the technologies uh, that are flavor of the month at the moment. Yeah. So, if you weren't really sure about cloud or AI, here's actually some chapters that actually allow you to go into that in a bit more depth. There's been there's been an interesting sort of theme I've just heard from the pair of you, which is like the uh, the, the 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 fintech buzzword bingo that, <laughs> that sometimes we hear, and it's utilizing tools like uh, words like blockchain, IoT, AI, um, you know, data. We've you know we've heard some some of those as well, cloud. I'm you know, I've been speaking to people for you know incessantly for three times a week on these shows for the, for the last uh, two three months or so all the way through the you know the lockdown period, and uh, th there's a lot of excitement around all of those different areas and people who are who are building some fantastic products and, and adding real value to it. Where where do you see the sort of real hotspots? Where are you really excited, the pair of you at the moment, in terms of uh, of, of where technology technology lies in B two B capital or B two B fintech? Maybe if I start on cloud as an initial point, um, mm. you know, in principle, that's been out there forever. Uh, but actually, the reality is, is that at least from a public cloud point of view, there's not really been uh, the engagement uh, from the large financial institutions that you would have expected. Yeah. And of course, what that then means is that a lot of the fintech firms that are really SaaS based firms that are trying to engage and collaborate with them have difficulty doing so if actually the banks and the other financial institutions haven't really onboarded that way of working. Um, so yeah, I think what's um, been a fortunate sort of piece of, I suppose, the lockdown process is that with people working from home, um, those institutions have been forced into using cloud services uh, mm. that maybe they wouldn't have done before. Mm. So some of those uh, security issues that they would have been concerned about previously um, uh, have now been pushed to one side to a certain extent. And it's kind of, well, yeah, what were you worried about? This, this is working now. Uh, yeah, you can actually provide these services. You've got to use a, a public cloud rather than a private sort of network. Um, and uh, so from that perspective, yeah, yeah I think that's, that's gonna open up so many avenues for so many firms to be able to collaborate more yeah. And I think, you know, as part of that process then as well, yeah, and I, I'll use the word collaborate mm -hmm. all the time here because I think from a B2B perspective, it's not always about disruption that it might be on the B2C side. It really is the collaboration sort of piece. Um, you know, and I think from, from that side, um, the ability now, I think, of those firms to recognize they can use the cloud, therefore it is easier to collaborate with some of the fintech firms yeah. And then, of course, as part of that process, you can go more into some of the individual technology pieces, whether yeah, artificial intelligence is the obvious one for me, yeah. uh, just by virtue of the fact that given the amount of data that's out there, um, yeah, that's kind of the key piece uh, where people have got to start using that more to recognize trends, to understand how they can actually engage uh, with their own customers more as well. There's definitely a lot that the, the financial services industry, I think, can take from, you know, so I've said this a few times, the retail industry in particular around how 
AI and data are being used to really drive performance. And that that cloud thing you know, comes comes up again and again and again. It's just uh, you know those sort of security fears were so unfounded that they're actually being shown to be you know it's it's opened the doors to to a, a massive digital revolution, which is really exciting. I think for the financial services sector. Suzanne, tell tell us your thoughts on do you, do you echo that or there, are there other yes, areas as well that you're saying? I mean, I definitely agree with everything Brendan just said. And maybe just to add on to that, you know, we just had our selection days for our next investor round, which takes place next month. And we always choose about 16 fintech companies, you know, they're the best of all the people who apply to us and they present to our judges. And out of those 16, we choose the top eight, which we then take forward to the investment evening. And uh, among those top eight, we had, you know, two super interesting companies in the B2B space. One company was focused on legal tech. Um, okay. And it's about, you know, when you think about debt agreements, loan agreements, uh, 300 pages long, you know, the complicated lending agreements. And this fintech company, a legal tech company, they can, they use AI, NLP to read the whole agreement and extract, you know, on a one pager, the key things you need to know. And, uh, and that's, you know, when I spoke to other people actually using those agreements in practice, that this would be a life change for us. You know, mm -hmm. having those agreements would save us weeks and would call this be so much more cost effective. You know, so these are very interesting use cases now, which really make a huge difference, you know, to the bottom line of, of banks, but also of any other lending companies, for example. And another company which we chose, you know, for Investor Day is a company focused on equity research. You know, and after, you know, after MIFID 2 now, you know, anybody has to pay for equity research, has to justify why it's actually good research. And we also know that normally more than 90% of all equity research is not being read. Unfortunately, it's just being distributed, but not being read. So this company, what they do is actually select um, the best research providers and they justify they can prove why it is generating alpha as well so that you can then explain which research you want to keep which ones you want to get rid of you know to, to reduce your costs and uh, and also just help you to be more wise in your investment as an asset manager you know as a fund manager but as a research provider they help you to benchmark yourself against other research providers to ensure that you really stand out you know from the crowd so these are again are b2b solutions you know which are really useful and very much in need and which we see coming up now but we also saw a very interesting b2c company which we selected which was focused on cryptocurrency and it was focused on tax because that's what the company always said, it's, it's the dirty little secret that mm -hmm. most people who treat cryptocurrencies don't pay tax. Yeah. And unfortunately now, you know, the HMRC, the US uh, government office, they know, they often have got all the addresses of all people who have bought and sold cryptocurrencies because they're getting those database information from the big exchanges. And in the States already, they have been sent letters out you know, to all people who trade cryptocurrencies to ensure that they file those in the next tax return. But of course, the issue is it's super complicated, you know, because if you have made lots of trades, how do you calculate, you know, your gains, your losses, to offset, what can you offset? And, and there's a fintech company out there who does it for you, you know? And so, so that's one which we will look at for investor day as well. So it's, you know, both B2B and B2C, you know, super interesting <coughs> innovations coming up. And sometimes, you know, I feel everything should have been invented already, you know, because you've seen many years <laughs> of invention, but then you're always surprised when you see this nugget of, of future wisdom, you know, which have not been invented, but it's just being invented in front of our eyes. That's what really makes it exciting because we can see literally how the market moves forward, you know, in front of us. I think that's, uh, that's, that's amazing, isn't it? Because, it, you know, innovation is one of those sort of words that gets thrown around a lot, but there's so many different things that, 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 um, you know, that there's still to be done and still to be invented and where things can, you know, can add value. And I think if you look at the three things that you sort of uh, highlighted within that was uh, in your, you know, in a, inadvertently or deliberately, you were talking about saving time, reducing cost and adding value, which seems to me to be the, like the investor's, um, you know, golden pot, doesn't it? In terms of what you're, you're looking to, uh, to, you know, to achieve from it. Yeah. With, with both of you guys looking at, um, you know, early stage, you know, companies and, and, and I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this sort of space because there's a lot of companies out there who seem to have very, very good ideas, but fail to commercialize it or don't necessarily answer the right issues. Tell us a little bit about um, what both of you would would uh, you know, would look at in terms of 
uh, you know what makes what makes a successful company what what puts the odds in your favor when you're back in the right sort of horse in this space i think um initially it has to be the they're actually not just having tech for tech's sake yeah uh, but it is the fact that there is a problem they've identified yeah. the problem so if it is tax in cryptocurrencies uh, then that is a, a key problem that needs to be answered um, and actually they're then generating some technology that actually really meets that that issue or that problem and you know i think that's where with a lot of the firms that i speak to at least um they're not 25 year olds uh, they're probably more likely to be 45 year olds um, they've actually been in the business for a long period of time they've understood where the issues are um, have actually been in a position to then you know, maybe leave a, a financial institution have actually bootstrapped that you know had the wherewithal to be able to bootstrap it for about a year or so uh, and then are in a position to to come to the market with yeah you know, they already have an M mvp um, they've maybe done some proof of concepts already with some of the people that they know in the markets so they've got some of their own network already um, mm -hmm. yeah and then it's really a question of uh, they need to move on to the next step which is more the sales marketing sort of type piece on top of that and really commercialize the, the project or the, the product after that piece so to, for me as a starting point that's kind of where they need to be at um, yeah. rather you know even if it is we, we call it seed but in a, in a sense they're almost sort of post seed in that they, they've been able to bootstrap it themselves yeah uh, but yeah i think that's the the key sort of starting point for anything really and Suzanne, you'd, you'd echo that. I see, I see you nodding there as well. Yes, I mean, I, I agree 100%. And I would say also in our environment now, you know, after Corona or during Corona, it's I think people and investors are more cautious, naturally, you know, because we don't know what the future will hold for us. And we don't know if it's just a... a, a De, I mean, a recession or if you're moving into an actual depression, you know, how long it will last and how long, you know, when the debt default bubble occurs, you know, all those big question marks out there, which of course have got a knock on effect on anybody else around us, you know, and would have a knock on effect on the whole investment, follow up investment ladder, you know, our startups have to go through to scale up. And, uh, and so therefore, what you want is when you invest in, in companies, fintech companies now, you want them to be very careful about how they spend money and, uh, and that they are realistic. And like, like Brandon said, that they can bootstrap, you know, that they can able to cut costs and, uh, and that they are not, you know, I think in the past few years, we've seen fintech companies, some of them became really big, but they have been growing based on venture capital funding, you know, where VCs put in hundreds of millions of pounds every year. And they're still loss making, you know, they're still after many years, they're still loss making. And if one of the VCs stops investing, they would literally blow up. You know, it would mm. be that's a bubble bursting. And that's why people talk about now, is it the internet bubble, you know, repeating itself 20 years later with fintech. And I think in some cases it might be, you know, we don't know that yet, but I think if one is not careful, you know, that could be an outcome. And so what we, for example, when we look at the financials, you know, forecasts of startups, we're looking carefully uh, where does the money go to and where does it come from? Mm. And, uh, and do people expect lots of funding rounds before they can break even? And if you're an early stage investor and you've got lots of funding rounds after you have invested, your equity stake gets diluted naturally. Mm. And, uh, and then, you know, it's not as attractive as somebody can move to break even point faster. And those are the things I think, you know, which, which we analyze in order. And that's very important nowadays because it's cash is king, you know, in our environment at the moment. And so I think any fintech company who are able to preserve cash and are smart about, you know, growing the business at lower cost and acquiring clients cheaper, you know, via partnerships, via the ecosystem approach, that really makes sense. So, so it's an interesting time, isn't it? And, and with, with you know, we, we're speaking now at the end of September, October on our on our doorsteps. Um, you know, there's talk of second lockdowns and, and such like. Uncertainty is exactly where, where we are with what you've spoken about: recession, depression. You know, what what comes next? When's a vaccine coming through? When do we get back to to any sense of normal? 
from from an investor point of view, that you know that brings enormous volatility and and, and increases the risk significantly. Yet there still seems to be a relatively strong appetite from investment companies, VCs, uh, angels to recognise this could be a great time to be investing at the moment. At the moment, what what's your what's your, your view of the marketplace and what and what are, we, what are we seeing out there at the moment? Is there that is the appetite down? Is the appetite up? Is this an opportunity or is it a time to uh, um, you know? wait and see what's the what's the right thing to be doing at the moment yeah i mean what what i've seen you know so far was initially i would say from march until summer uh <clears> the market <throat> almost stood still you know investors were watching basically looking what happens around them and were backing up existing portfolio companies to ensure that they can survive you know kind of free investing more money into existing portfolio companies that they can come out of Corona, you know, in a positive way, but people did not invest in new companies, you know, less so because it was not even possible to meet in person. You know, and when you invest in early stage companies, one of the key things is that you want to meet the team in person. You want to get to know the founders, you want to build up a relationship, you know, you want to trust them and all this just via Zoom is difficult, you know? So I think what we've seen is that people were backing up existing portfolio companies, but overall the investment numbers went down, you know, investment figures went down. Uh, when you speak to later stage investors, you know, the private equity houses or large VCs, I mean, as you said, they all want to invest in FinTech, but they, many of them believe that valuations will come down and therefore it makes sense for them to wait and see because they can come in at a later stage at cheaper valuations. You know, when there's a, a, a more pressure, more distressed environment that people can come in and buy high quality companies at lower costs. So mm -hmm. I think that's what we can see at the top end of the market. But I think long term, I mean, the appetite, the demand for fintech won't evaporate you know it will be here it's just will fluctuate i think over the next short term short term future and are you seeing similar to that as well brendan yeah no completely agree on the initial sort of look after your own portfolio firms first see if they need any funding uh, basically support them to begin with it'd be interesting going further forward now again if we differentiate between the b2c and the b2b so you know if i'm um, Without naming names, if, I, I'm, if I'm kind of a, a client of a, um, a challenger bank, maybe I was using one of their cards because it was convenient for me to, to use it for everyday expenses. Mm. Um, but if I'm at home most of the time now, I'm not really using it for that anymore. Uh, so you know, how does that sort of fit? And talking about the, the cash burn, um, yeah, a lot of cash burn for B2C firms tends to be much more around um, the cost of advertising or the cost of you know, basically winning a, a, an additional customer and how much you know, that's going to be for you. In the new environment, how does that one sort of play out and you know, where does it come through? So you're burning, but you're not necessarily getting the return back uh, because people don't see the, the benefit of your product as much. Whereas if I turn to the B2B bit, being a bit biased again, sort of from that point of view, um, if there the actual realisation is, actually now we've got to start using more of these products, we've got to collaborate more. Uh, so therefore, actually, we're going back into another lockdown with people working from home. Um, yeah, how are we going to basically make our own new processes much more efficient as part mm. of that process? Um, and certainly there, whether it's the fact that you don't have as many useless internal meetings uh, <laughs> that you, you have to uh, work your way through to, but talking to some of the firms that I'm involved with, they've actually found there's been more time available to talk to people about what they could be doing. Yeah. You're also, from a budgetary point of view, I suppose, at the moment, getting towards the end of the year, for, for some institutions, it will be a case of use it or lose it. Um, so perhaps there'll be more um, you know, willingness from them to, to look at proof of concepts or, or proof, proof of value, as some people call it, um, because they've got some budget to use before the end of the year now. Um, they've got it used to a kind of remote environment. Um, so people have actually got a bit more time maybe on their hands mm. to actually work with the product to really understand whether um, it's doing what um, you know, it says on the tin kind of thing. 
Uh, so I think from that perspective, it'd be interesting to see how those two different parts of the broad church sort of play out as well, uh, because um, you know, they're, they're pandering to different types of customer. Uh, and those customers maybe have very different needs and wants at this point in time. Yeah, it's it's a it's a it's been a remarkable sort of period, um, you know, for 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 the industry. I, I've seen a very robust sort of performance from the financial services and, and technology sector in particular, and the vast majority. And you know, I know there's been casualties, and and uh, and I think that's natural. But there's also been companies I've seen double and treble headcount. Um, there's been companies there who who by and large have answered problems and provided solutions and 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 been pretty strong. Is that what you've seen from from your stables as well? Have you seen good performance across the industry, and why is that? We we also have seen that yes. I mean we I mean tomorrow and the day afterwards, for example, I'm part of Nesta. You know Nesta, the UK government agency focused on open banking, and and we have we are the judges. You know for the Nesta Open Challenge competition, where the winners will get large money uh, prizes, large cash prizes. You know the ones we choose in the next two days. And there are a couple of them who have done incredibly well during Corona. You know, they have grown by three-digit figures, you know, over the last six months because they were yeah. in a niche which just became so important all of a sudden. And you never would have had this back uh, drop, you know, growth drivers without Corona. So they usually benefited. And, uh, and so we definitely have seen that. And what, what I also would think is, you know, that Corona will lead to consolidation in the market as well. So you will see some ser sectors merging, you know, which is really interesting. So when you think about the challenger banks, you know, which we talked about before, you know, some of those challenger banks, uh, if they only focus on savings, I mean, they, it's difficult for them to make money because mm -hmm. you don't charge, you know, for private bank accounts in the UK. Uh, however, if they can provide loans, sets away how they could earn money but often those challenger banks have no credit scoring capabilities you know they don't know how to provide and, and choose you know whom to give loans to but there are lots of lenders out there lots of alternative lenders out there you know and merging those or so acquiring a lender for a challenger bank who has no not enough expertise on the lending side would be almost a marriage made in heaven because mm. you've got then lots of customers whom you can actually monetize and you create a synergy in the industry which makes perfect sense and so i think those you know types of consolidation will also drive you know, success in the future. So it's not just about your own organic growth, but it will be more about acquisitions, mergers, joint ventures going forward. You know, so one has to be strategically open, you know, what's around you and see what can you work on, which which makes sense strategically for your own business. Mm. And there's been various or numerous examples of where companies have got that absolutely right and a number where, where the sort of uh, soul is sucked out of them by the wrong sort of ones that, that by yes. the same rationale. Yes. Brendan, what, what, what are you seeing? Are you see, seeing similar sort of, uh, you know, obviously change, but also optimism in the marketplace at the moment? I think if I take that theme from a different perspective and look at it from just one financial institution and say, OK, so as an institution, I've got core legacy systems. And what we've kind of been pushing for a long period of time is that rip and replace obviously isn't mm -hmm. the way for, forward because there's too much risk associated with that. But there really should be, whether you call it core satellite or hub and spoke sort of type models, where you're really looking to keep that core system, which you know, does a job. Uh, it hasn't fallen over. You know, it's pretty robust. But around the edges where you really need that efficiency and the ability to be agile uh, with respect to winning new business or new customers, that's where you really need to engage with the fintech firms. Mm. And so I think from there, um, the reason why some of those firms are doing well now is, again, there's a greater realization of that. Um, some of the, um, yeah, the ability to use cloud, as we've mentioned already, then to deploy that helps. Um, maybe some of the procurement and infosec requirements from some of the institutions maybe is then, I'm not saying it's got, still got room for improvement mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's maybe got a bit better and of course yeah most of the time these conversations are not new ones necessarily they're conversations that may have well been going on for the last nine to twelve months um, and it's now kind of a realization that we've been talking about this for a long period of time this maybe is a catalyst 
to actually get something over the line, if you know what I mean. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so we're we're in a situation now where there's going to, where you know we're, we're we're still sailing through these sort of stormy seas at the moment in the, you know in, in financial technology, well, in, just in humanity at large, with this uncertainty. You guys bring um, huge experience with you know with you about having seen numerous different things. You know, we spoke about the dot com bubble beforehand. Um, we've you know we've, we've spoken about 2000, 2008 and we, we're in this at the moment be it recession depression things will things move further forward and uh there's unique insight that you can give to business if you're going to give one bit of advice to a company that comes to you and saying look we've got a you know we're, we're a business in, in, in financial technology at the moment who are looking to move you know further forward and to navigate this sort of time and set ourselves up for for long-term success there afterwards what would that one nugget be? What would be the thing that you'd leave people with if they came to you with that question? I know it's a big one, so I'm giving you a little bit more time here to uh, to think about it as I work through the question. But I'll come to you first, Suzanne, because you're looking, no, you're nodding and Brendan's thinking. So, so I'm going to come to you first. I mean, I would say, I, I mean, I always have to say two things, Toby, for me. I mean, the first one would be, of course, to take advantage of the offer the UK government has given to companies like bounce back loans. You know, any fintech company who apply, could apply for it should apply for those loans, should take advantage of, I mean, the furlough scheme is coming to an end, but you know, if it applies to companies, they should take advantage of those uh, schemes which have been put in place by the government, I would say that's one of the basics. But afterwards, I would say it's about being flexible, you know, being flexible and being quick. Because one thing, when I looked at all the companies as part of Nestle's, you know, what we admired a lot of companies which pivoted, you know, they saw this huge opportunity which came out of Corona, where most people were just stood still and were almost scared to do anything. But some companies took it as a huge opportunity to launch a new product, a new side product, which is now doing very well. And these opportunities, uh, you know, are rarely happening so quickly as we've seen now. So if somebody's intellectually flexible and can pivot quickly, that's what startups are very good at, you know, because we don't have long governance decision making cycles. <coughs> but startups can act fast. And so speed is of essence, I think, to respond to market opportunities and challenges both. But that's, I would say that, you know, so act quickly when you see an opportunity and go for it. And that sort of comes around to the, the, the sort of uh, the dirty word that's become a, a good word in, in FinTech at the moment, which is pivot, right? Pivot to opportunities and make sure you're acting to, to what's in front of you. Yes. Brendan, what's, what's, your, what's your golden nugget? I was actually thinking the complete opposite. <laughs> so, that's uh, that's the beauty of co-authors isn't it <laughs> <laughs> um, i think that if i look at most of the firms that i'm uh, involved with um actually they they stuck to their knitting yeah. um so they identified a problem they have a solution and actually it's just the fact that it was taking longer than you would hope to actually get that over the line uh, and so therefore, rather than taking the, the risk of pivoting into doing something else, stretching yourself too thinly, and then not actually being in a position to be ready and able to, to push some of the projects that you've been talking about for the last you know, year to 18 months, um, it's actually keeping with uh, that core sort of business idea uh, and believing in that and actually it's now been a case of the clients are coming to them with the realization that we've really got to do something now, yeah. as opposed to them deciding, let's do a quick pivot and do something that seems a little bit sexier uh, and you know, hope to get some new business quickly off the back of that. So again, I think that really is dependent on the type of product that you're obviously putting into the marketplace. And for certain things, obviously pivoting might be a good idea uh, but uh, for others, I'd say you know, if you're kind of starting from scratch and having to rebuild sort of something, albeit with existing technology, um, yeah, there's always the question then about how robust it's going to be, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, so you, you're kind of going back to an MP, MVP already, um, you know, as it were, sort of from that point of view, when you've actually got a fully fledged product ready to go that is... Mm. It's, it's this difficulty, I think, with large financial institutions. Yeah, you obviously need to have something that they can scale. Uh, and if you've pivoted, there's probably more some questions around whether you know, now you, that can scale. Whereas if it's a B2C product in an open banking environment, 
uh, probably the individual customers are a little bit more forgiving if there's a, a few quirks uh, sort of with the product at that point in time. So probably it really depends on where, where, yeah, who you're talking to and who you're selling to. It is fascinating, isn't it? Because there's there's two things there which are, which are uh, in some ways contradictory advice, but also at the same sort of time, completely dependent on who you're speaking to and what sort of stage, isn't it? And, and uh, yeah, there's, I think there's a big difference between the sort of pivot, is, which is a huge lurch from one expedient to the next, to how you how you adapt your core niche business, which has always been my you know drum that I that I've banged, but to sit alongside that, the ability to adapt to the situation and provide you know services you know, to, to to your customers' needs, and I think if you are a business in this space, if you are customer led, invariably that is the, the you know the golden ticket to me that allows people to uh, you know, to be successful from it. Listen, we've raced through this in, in, in incredible, it's, uh, you know, I always say it, it's, a, it's an old record for me about how quickly this time goes. And I could spend hours with the pair of you because it's just a source of such great wisdom. But I want to I want to circle back to the book, which in October, I want to uh, um, complement my backup library here, here with it as well. I'm looking forward to getting the physical uh, version in my head, but it's available digitally now. It's over in the States. You can buy it physically as well. You're waiting for your copies to, to arrive at the moment. Tell everyone how they can get a copy on it copy of it yes so the fintech for dummies book at the moment you know people can buy it on amazon on all bookshops actually online via wiley our publisher uh, but from middle of october onwards the hard copies will arrive in europe so then you can get your hard copy as well and uh, and also in asia will all, all happening in the next few weeks now and, and as we are really looking forward ourselves to hold our first physical book in our hands um, and I think it will be an amazing book. You know, anybody who is wants to learn about fintech will benefit from this book because you, I myself learned a lot from my co-authors, you know, from Brendan, from Stephen in New York, from Dawn, from James. So we were five co-authors and we put all our combined knowledge in this book. So that's why it hopefully will be lots of uh, good reading, you know, for all our readers and add lots of value. Well, I can't wait to get a little, I've, always, I've said to you before, before we started shooting that it's always been one of my great uh, thrills when I see your books, uh, at, particularly predominantly at airports. I see it at a lot of airports, back in the days when we used to travel by air, yes. <laughs> um, when, it, when, it, when, it was, when it was there and it was a great buzz. And I'll tell you a story actually, just very briefly. There was a, uh, a chap who came to me a couple of years ago with, with a copy of the book and he said, I've just read this. He was in commodities technology at the, st at the stage and, and he goes, I want to get into fintech and fast forward now a couple of years and he's, he's been... Uh, He's had two C, you know, C level jobs in in uh, in fintech firms based off having read your uh, your fintech book. So I'm I'm sure this fintech for dummies is is now going to uh, inspire the next generation of great uh, great moves into the fintech space. And he's doing incredibly well in the business that has just gone like that, even Amazing. through great 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 funding at the start of it. And uh, he's doing a, a tremendous job with it. That's so great. you should um, tell him Toby to get in touch with me. I would love to get to know him as well. It's excellent. I will do. I will do. Yes. I'm sure you may know him already, but I'll, pa I'll pass you the details on. Yes. Our, our, our as well. to, to your point earlier, Toby, this is now 2.0 already. So. There we go. I mean, it's, uh, it, you've got to be, you've got to be, well, I know you're writing a book, another book already, but I'm looking forward to the follow-up. It's, uh, it's, a, it evolves at such an incredible pace, doesn't it? This, this, this industry. And it's, uh, some exciting stuff with it. Listen, both of you are adding real value to the marketplace at the moment and to so many different companies within it. For people who want to reach out to, to, to you, Brendan, what's the best way of doing that? Uh, and, who email, should, and who should be as well? Uh, email is brendan at seismicfoundry.com. Um, this year, I'm not necessarily investing, uh, but uh, actually uh, sticking with my existing firms, but always happy yeah. to, to look at some decks and give some uh, advice and guidance to the firms that are coming into the space. And if a diamond's there in the rough, I'm sure that you'll uh, you'll make an exception. <laughs> and uh, Su Suzanne, uh, how, where should people get in touch with you? Yes, they can either on LinkedIn, you know, I'm on LinkedIn under Suzanne Chisti or on Twitter or Instagram, uh, also via email, and info at fintechcircle.com. And for fintech companies who want to apply to fintech circles angel network they can apply online they just go to our website fintechcircle.com then you see the funding you know the options you just apply online so that you can be part of our next investment around fantastic well listen guys thank you so much for, for sharing your wisdom i can't wait to read the book i've loved the conversation i really really enjoyed it and uh thanks for joining us today thank you very much thanks, it's great to be here Great stuff. And thank you all for watching. We'll see you soon on another episode of FinTech Focus TV. Thanks a lot.